Father, we do uh, uh, ask today, God, that you would meet us here. We've come from a lot of different places, Lord, different places in life, different places physically, different places spiritually. And yet I know, Lord, that you want to meet each one of us, that you care about us individually. And I pray that as we open your word, as we read your word, it wouldn't just be reading about something that happened, but God, it would be meeting you in the pages of Scripture. Thank you for getting anointing men to uh, write this down for us. Thank you for keeping it all these years. And we can have the truth, and we know that the truth sets us free. So I pray that we would just, Lord, hear you today. And God, we could leave here encouraged and strengthened in our faith. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you've been with us for a while, you know that uh, this is the last trial of Jesus. We've been through five trials. We saw him before Annas. We saw him before Caiaphas. Then he went back, and we didn't see, but we know he went back before the Sanhedrin. So that was three trials with the Jews that were all illegal. They were all bogus trials, but they held him. Then they sent him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, talked to him for a bit, didn't kind of like the answers he was getting. Then Pilate sent him to Herod, and Herod had fun with him, and then Herod sent him back to Pilate, and that's kind of where we're at now. So think about that. Think about all the miscarriage of justice, everything that went on, and yet we're going to watch Jesus, and his demeanor never changes. Nothing changes with him for one reason. He was trusting his God. And that's where we need to get. We need to be those kind of people. I know it's easy to trust God when everything's going well, right? It's not a problem, man. I can trust him. But what about when your world's falling apart? What about when everything's coming undone? What about when it's like the worst it could ever be? Are you still going to trust him? And that's the question. And here's the thing. You're only going to trust him if you know him. And you're only going to know him by getting in his word and understanding who he is and who we are. I think there's an important question that we need to ask that we might even ask Pilate, are you going to go by public opinion or are you going to go by truth? I think if I asked you that here today, most of us would say we're going to go by truth. Are we really? How many of us go by opinion? How many of us maybe we're not in our word, we don't read our word? Some of you think I'm the one who's going to give you the word, and you know what? I'm fallible, right? I'm not perfect. The only truth, true truth, you can always count on is his word. It's not that I want to, I'm not trying to deceive you guys. But I think it's important we understand that. It's not about what somebody else thinks. It's about your relationship with him. And so Jesus, I think, is going to teach us that today. So starting in verse 1, it says, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. So here's what's going on. He's come back to Pilate. Pilate has asked him a couple questions. The Jews aren't giving up. So here's what Pilate thinks, I think. I think he thinks, hey, maybe if I give them a little bit of blood, they'll be satisfied. If we kind of go this far, maybe that'll satisfy their thirst and their desire to uh, inflict as much pain as possible on him. So I know I'll have him scourged. Now, I think a lot of us were familiar. We've been in church a while. The scourging was with a, with a whip that had a handle and a lot of leather tongs on it. And then on the end of those, there might have been pieces of bone, might have even been steel balls to bruise. And when it would hit somebody, you know, it would bruise and, and then the bone and stuff would tear flesh. Most people say that very few men survived the scourging. That oftentimes their entire back would be ripped open and you could see their organs and stuff. I don't, I don't know how true that is. That's what, that's what you read about. A horrific ordeal. And so Jesus is going to go through that. Now the interesting thing is, again, if you're reading all the Gospels, I didn't give you the reference for him this week because I've been giving them to you. But hey, the end of Mark, the end of Matthew, the end of, of Luke, if you read those, there's a little bit of discrepancy between John and Luke and Mark and Matthew and Mark. So John and Luke kind of put it in one area. 
Matthew and Mark put it in another area, and then some people go, maybe there were two scourgings. I don't think so. Once again, you're, ta- you're looking at men who are looking at something and giving that description from their perspective. And so always keep that in mind. So we come to this now. He scourged, oh, and then we read in verse 2, the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. These are some pretty ruthless guys, right? These guys don't care. They don't care. They're ruthless. They want to inflict pain. And, you know, as far as they're concerned, this is just another criminal that they're going to treat the way they treat all criminals and are going for it, other than he was called the King of the Jews. So they mock that. They put the crown of thorns on him. Isn't it interesting that sin brought in thorns and thistles, right? If you read Genesis. And isn't it interesting, the one taking away sin is wearing a crown of thorns. I I think that's very fitting, right? I don't think these guys knew what they were doing, but it's fitting. And then they put a robe on him. Now according to, I believe it's Matthew or Mark or Luke, trying to get you to read them. One of them says they would put the robe on him and then they would rip it off and then they would put him on him again. Think about, think about, most of us have had some kind of, some kind of scabs in our lives, some kind of thing that you dress, a wound that you dress and the dressing's on there and every time you take it off it's painful and it rips. That's what they were doing to him. So think about all of the, not just the injustice, but the pain that he's enduring. It's physical pain and Jesus was a real human being. He's having to endure that. He's having to go through that. And he's enduring it for one reason. Not so that we would feel pity for him. He's enduring it so he can go to the cross and die for our sin. Don't ever forget that. Don't lose sight of that. And so some people get into the whole pity thing and they want to make this as gruesome as possible so we feel bad and sorry for Jesus. You know what? That's not going to save you. The only thing that saves you is repentance, coming to him, repentance and trusting him. So yeah, it's horrible, but he's enduring it. So they get done with that, and then it says, verse 4, Pilate went out again. Now, you know, I, I, I kind of want to get in Pilate's head. Like, what's going on with this dude? He doesn't want to do what's going on. He's already said once or twice that Jesus is innocent. He's trying to deal with all of this, but we have to remember what he's done so far. Rome is pretty angry with him. And he can't make the Jews mad again. He's done it twice. He's like, you know, done horrible things. So he can't afford to make them mad again, or he's going to lose his position. But he knows, I'm dealing with an innocent guy here. This guy's done nothing. And now what do you do? And, you know, and then uh, I believe his wife has talked to him. Some people say, no, she doesn't talk to him until a little bit later on. Who cares? His wife tells him, dude, don't do this. And he's got all of that, and he's trying to deal with that, and he's getting pressure. I mean, I can't imagine what's going on in this guy's mind and heart. I don't think he's as wicked as some people make him. I think he's just, I think he's just in a bad position from bad decisions and do we ever get that way you ever make bad decisions that get you in a bad position where you've got to maybe compromise some things so that you can stay in that position and that's where Pilate's at now I've told you guys before man when I read my Bible sometimes I start praying for these guys and I'm like praying come on Pilate repent come on you can do this just turn and do good and he never does but don't you want him to do good? Yeah, and so Pilate comes out and tells us, Pilate went out again in verse 4 and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. He's done nothing wrong. I'm bringing him out. Now, imagine, here's what he brought out, is a person that according to Isaiah couldn't even be recognized as a human being. So you've got this 
you know, bloody mess next to you, and you go, oh, by the way, he's done nothing wrong. That's insane, isn't it? I mean, man, that's got to be crazy. And then, you know, we know back in the back of his mind, he's done nothing wrong, but I have to carry this out, or I'm going to lose my position. I'm going to lose everything. And Mrs. Pilate's going to be really mad at me, right? Because she told me, get away from that man. I had a dream. You don't want anything to do with him. So he's doing it. So he tells them, you know, that. And so then, verse 5, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. Jesus was a man at this point. He was God who became man to take away our sin. And it's interesting that he says it that way because to me, he is the man. At this moment, he is the man because he's about to take my sin away. Right? And he says, so behold the man. And verse 6 says, therefore when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. This is the second time right now. And he goes, you guys do it. You guys take care of it. Now, here's the thing. Pilate knows they can't do it. He knows they don't have the authority to do it. Remember, we've talked about that. The whole point of, of, of them bringing him to Pilate was because they did not have the authority, and they wouldn't have crucified him anyway. They would have stoned him, but they didn't have the authority so Pilate is in some ways, I think, mocking them. But in another way, I think he's like, I wish I, I, wish I would have never got out of bed today. Right? I just wish this would go away. I wish this wasn't happening. And part of me thinks, yeah, well, it's happening because of all of your prior bad decisions, bro. And now you're having to pay for those. And so now he's, he's trying to push it off on the Jews and trying to tell them. So then, listen, he tells them, you guys go crucify him. Verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Now I think there's some important things that they're saying here. Number one, for all of the cults in the world that say Jesus never claimed to be God, Hmm. The Jews thought he claimed to be God. The ones who were there thought he claimed that because they're saying, listen, this guy is claiming to be deity and he deserves to die. According to Leviticus chapter 24, it says this, and whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. And that's where they're taking him. Now, if you've been paying attention, because I think this is important, when the Jews first brought Jesus to Pilate, what was their accusation? Their accusation was, he claims to be king, and there's no king but Caesar. They're going to declare that again in a minute. But what are they accusing him of here? It's not the same accusation. Now they change, and they go, oh, wait a minute. This guy, this guy said... He was the son of God. He's claiming deity, therefore he blasphemed God. So I think that's important to kind of pay attention to. Their whole accusations change. And so, listen, they should be the ones to put him to death. Oh, one more thing. As Rome would put these different governors in place, they were not just responsible for Roman law. They were also responsible for local law. So Pilate was supposed to uphold their laws because that was his responsibility. So now they brought it up. According to our law, he deserves death. So Pilate, you need to do what we're telling you to do, or we're going to go to Rome, and you're going to lose your position. You choose. Now once again, Pilate's faced with public opinion or truth. Which one are you going to go with? Depends on where you're at, doesn't it? So he's got to deal with that. So that's what they put before him. And then it says in verse 6, Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. Or we might say much afraid. 
or we might say freaked out, right? I mean, Pilate's like, I can't believe what they're doing to me. It's like, I know this guy's done nothing wrong, and I've already, I gave him a taste of blood. That should have satisfied them, and they're not satisfied with that. And now they're telling me, listen, they're telling me this is their law. Remember, he's got to uphold their law. That's part of his responsibility. And now he's like much afraid because I believe Mrs. Pilate's already warned him, right? He's gone through all of that. What do I do, man? I am in, I, this is a really bad day for Pilate, right? What am I going to do? He's much afraid. So here's what, he, <laughs> here's what he thought. I'll just go talk to Jesus again. So it tells us in verse 9, and listen, he was more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? Wow, what a question. Isn't that a question all of us should ask? Where is Jesus from? Listen, he's not from Galilee. Where's he from? He's from God, right? And that would be the right response. Hey, Jesus, where are you from? And I, I, I can't imagine, I don't think Pilate's asking this because he's really curious, and I'll show you why in a moment, but he asked Jesus again. I think he's stalling. I think he's not wanting to carry this out. I think he's in that freak mode. So Jesus, where are you from? And then it tells us at the end of verse 9, but Jesus gave him no answer. Why did Jesus not answer him? Because he already has answered that question. In 1836, listen, 1836, here's what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of here. Where are you from? Not from here. And then Jesus goes on in verse 37. You say rightly that I am king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who, hear, everyone who is of the truth hears my words. Jesus already answered that question. So Jesus just like looks at him. And I, I imagine Jesus looked at him with that look that went right into his soul. Like Pilate asked and answered. We already dealt with this. And so Jesus is quiet. Jesus is silent before him. Wouldn't it be hard to hold your silence? Wouldn't it be difficult? Wouldn't you want to just tell this guy off and get in his face and get it over with? Right? And so Jesus is quiet. So then Pilate, then Pilate does this. Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Like, duh. Right? Why should he speak to him? Are you not speaking to me? Don't you know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Oh, really, Pilate? You have that power? Then why aren't you doing it? He's already declared him innocent. I have power to release you. If you really had that power, you would have released him. But you really don't have that power. But you think you have that power. And it sounds really good to try and intimidate this man and say, I have the power to crucify you or I have the power to release you. Why are you not talking to me right now? Why aren't you speaking to me? And Pilate's in a place where a lot of us get to because we let our our, our, our personal well-being get in the way of what God is doing in our lives. One of the commentators put it this way. Deep inside his heart, Pilate knew that this was an idle boast. While theoretically he had the power, but in fact he did not. An overriding concern for his own political future had removed any real possibility that he would free Jesus. He's already in that place. He's fooling himself maybe when he's saying that. Maybe he's trying to relieve himself, but hey, what he's saying isn't true. So he puts that to Jesus and says that. Uh, Chuck Swindoll says this, and I think this is a question for all of us. Here's what Chuck Swindoll said. Pilate had to choose Tiberius, who's the Caesar, or Jesus. He had to choose the kingdoms of the earth or the kingdom of heaven. He had to choose power or truth. That's where he's at. And now, listen, we really need to pray for him now and root for him, right? Come on, man. Choose truth. 
Choose Jesus. Choose the kingdom of heaven. What are you doing? And Jesus even challenges him. Look at what Jesus says. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Do you hear what Jesus has just said? Here's what Jesus told him. My God is in complete control. And everything that's going on is according to my God's plan. Really? The beating you just endured? The thorns? The ridicule, the mocking, the punches in the face? Yeah, my God's in control. Nothing could happen. Listen to what he says. Nothing could happen to me unless it was from above. And then he says this, Therefore, the one who delivered me to you, or delivered me to you, has the greater sin. I don't think he's talking about Judas. I think he's talking about Caiaphas. Because Caiaphas had the greater light. Caiaphas knew exactly what he was doing. And I think Jesus is saying, that guy delivered me to you. He's got the greater sin. Not that he's absolving Pilate of any sin, but he's got greater sin. But do you hear, do you hear the heart of Jesus in this moment? Because I think all of us need to ask for that kind of faith. That when we're in that circumstance, when we're in the place where it's hurting the most, that we would be able to say, I know my God is in complete control, and I'm going to trust him. Because that's the hard time, right? That's when it really matters. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, one person put it this way. D.A. Carson said, said it this, and talking about God being in control. He said, if God merely outwits his enemies, whose evil, is set, uh, whose evil sets both the agenda and the pace, then the mission of the Son to die for fallen sinners is reduced to a mere afterthought. You hear what he's saying? If God is playing chess and only answering to what men are doing, then everything's for naught. But God is in control, and I want to be that way. When I grow up, that's how I want to be. When I face, so I'm a whiner. When, when things happen to me, I whine like, ask my wife. I, when things happen to me, what is this going on? I hate this. Just a confu- like a month and a half ago, I was whining like a three-year-old. And she's going, Pat, don't you teach people to trust Jesus? I go, yeah, that's for them. <laughs> Listen, if we're all honest, if we're all honest, we get there. It's difficult And I want to be like Jesus. I want to be able in the midst of that circumstance to say, here's what I know. My God is in control. And I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to put my entire well-being into his hands because he's in control. So Jesus answers Pilate. Now, I'm thinking Pilate's going, man, this is just getting worse and worse and worse. Right? And so verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. Really? Really? Pilate wanted to release him, then why doesn't he just do it? He's the governor. I mean, he's the guy in charge from Rome. So he was thinking of ways, because here's the thing. He did not want to ruin his relationship with the Jews. So here's the thing. It says he was uh, was, uh, uh, trying to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself king speaks against Caesar. Oh, now they're back to Jesus as king. And here's what they're saying. Pilate, you're doomed. We got you. You can't do what you want to do because we have you and you're going to do what we want you to do. And so you've got to do this now because we'll declare, hey, we have Caesar on speed dial. You make the wrong choice, we're calling him. And you're out, right? So they're, they're letting him know, hey, anybody who claims to be against Caesar, he deserves, right? He deserves to, to die, bottom line. So when Pilate heard, uh, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew is called Gabbatha. So I think this is important when we're thinking about this. So he comes out and sits on the judgment seat. 
at this moment, who's really being judged? Jesus or Pilate? Pilate is going to be judged for all of eternity for the decision he makes sitting on that chair. And that's important to think about because you know what? Our decisions matter. And we need to be careful of how we decide and things we decide on. So now he's at that place. He's going to make this final decision. He's ready now to, you know what? There's no going back after he makes this decision. That's kind of frightening, isn't it? And he's in that place and he's doing that. And then it tells us, it tells us uh, in, in verse 14, now it was a preparation day of Passover about the sixth hour and he said to the Jews, behold your king. Now there's a lot of debate and I don't want to get sidetracked here this morning. There's a lot of debate. Why is it the, the preparation day before Passover if Jesus and his disciples celebrated Passover and if he's killed on Passover, how can it be the preparation day? And I, I, listen, I don't want to get into the long debate. I believe, I believe what John is talking about. Remember they had the Passover, and then they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jews, even today, call all of that the Passover. And the preparation day would have been the day before Sabbath, which would have been Friday, which would have been more than likely the Passover that Jesus and his disciples ate Thursday night. You know, according, again, I believe Jesus was crucified on Friday. There's a big dilemma about that. But I, anyway, here's the thing. It's all during Passover week. We can at least say that, right? So that's going on. And then there's a big description. It's, it's like funny. It's like there's a lot of things you can start nitpicking about, and you miss the truth. There's a big discussion. He says it's the sixth hour. Mark, so the sixth hour is either 6 a.m. or 12 noon, depending on what, whose sundial you go by. So, it's either there. Mark, in his, gives the hour as 9 a.m. So, was it 6 a.m., 9 a.m., or 12 noon? Well, here's the thing. All of them say about, right? So, they didn't say, he didn't say it was the sixth hour on the dot. It was about the sixth hour. So, here's the way I think about it. You got 6 a.m., you got noon. What's in the middle? Nine, Mark's hour. So, we'll just go with that. Right? Here's the thing. We know, we know he was crucified before noon. So, hey, doesn't really matter, does it? Here's the thing. Here's what matters. Is Pilate brought him out and said, Behold your king to the Jews. Because that's what they were accusing him of. But they cried out, Away with him. Away with him crucify him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine just this crowd? These are religious men. These are men who are supposed to know the word and supposed to understand what's going on. And all they're screaming is crucify him. They know everything that they did and everything that Pilate did was illegal according to anybody's law. He was tried illegally six times. Six times. And now they're yelling, let's just kill him. Let's just put it like that, right? Because, hey, crucify even sounds better than kill him. But here's what they're saying. Kill him. Kill him right now. Get him off of this planet. Don't a lot of people want to do that with Jesus today? I don't want to talk about Jesus. Let's just get rid of him. You can't get rid of Jesus. So, listen, crucify him or kill him. And then, and then Pilate, poor Pilate. I feel sorry for him. I bet he was gray-headed after this. Right? It's like, in the middle of verse 15, Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? That's a good question, isn't it? Hey, he, you guys said he was king. He said he was king. You want me to crucify your king? And here's what they say. This is like one of the worst statements ever. He says, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. For reals? Like you guys are Jews. Aren't Jews supposed to be a theocracy? Aren't they supposed to be ruled by God? And now they're saying we have no king but Caesar? Here's an interesting thought. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you're familiar, remember Samuel was a, was a prophet. 
and he's leading Israel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8 is when they reject Samuel. And they say, we want a king like every other nation. Who are they really rejecting? Because remember what God told Samuel? Hey, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So in 1 Samuel chapter 8, they reject the father as king. In John 19, right now, they're rejecting Jesus as king. In Acts chapter 7, they reject the Holy Spirit as king. Huh. You kind of think, you kind of got to wonder, why did all of this calamity happen to the Jews? Really? You're rejecting your king, whether it be 1 Samuel chapter 8, whether it be John 19, whether it be Acts chapter 7. When we go to Israel, we use one guide often, Ronnie Simone, and Ronnie always does this in his Ronnie's voice, you know, why do the Jews suffer so much? And you're going, because you rejected Jesus, that's why. Because you brought that on yourself, and they need to know their decisions have consequences. So they rejected Jesus. Here they're saying, we have no king but Caesar. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of want to go, I don't want to hear that, blah, 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 you know, just don't say that. What's the matter with you guys? And then verse 16, then he delivered him to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. Seriously, Pilate? So we know that Pilate goes by public opinion, right? Or by opinion, not by truth. He's denying the truth to go by opinion. John MacArthur said this, in the end, think about this in our lives, in the end, pride and fear of man led to Pilate's downfall. And he sided with the crucifiers of Christ to the damnation of his own soul. He stands in history as a monumentally tragic figure privileged to converse privately with the Savior, and he found no favor in that opportunity. We're privileged. We can be with Jesus. We can get in a prayer closet and we can have a conversation with him. And we have that opportunity. We have his word. Where do we find truth? Do we find it in opinion or in his word? It's in his word. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, you're either for me or you're against me. You need to choose. You can't, there, did you ever notice when you read the Gospels, like when Jesus shows up, nobody ever goes, well, that was kind of interesting. They either are for him or against him. He always draws a line, and Jesus will always draw a line. Every culture, you know, every tribe, every nation, Jesus is going to draw that same line because it's truth. So how can I know the authentic Jesus. There's only one way to know the authentic Jesus. Get in his word. Oh, there's some people tell you, the, they'll give you their opinion, or they'll tell you to watch this TV series, or this program, or that program, and they'll give you the authentic Jesus. The only place you're going to find the authentic Jesus is in his word. That's where truth, and here's what I found. Every time I read it, it's the same. It doesn't change. And as I've been walking with the Lord all these years, it's always the same. It's solid. It's fact. And that's the way then I can face the tragedies in my life. Because I know my God is in control. And I know I can trust him. And here's what I've learned. He wants the absolute best for me because he loves me. And sometimes the best hurts. And it hurts deep. And it's hard. But my dad used to say, right, we all know, right, this is hurting me more than it's hurting you. And I used to think, you big fat liar. And then I had a child. And here's what you know. When you have to discipline a child, it's painful. Well, do you think God takes joy in disciplining us? Well, it's painful. But he loves us. If he didn't love us, he didn't care. Here's something I noticed. Like, my parents didn't spank all the kids on the block. They just spanked me and my brother. They're pretty particular. God loves us, and he disciplines those he loves. Because he wants us to grow up. 
So when we face things, I don't think very many of us are going to face something this extreme. But even if we do, he's still in complete control, and we need to know that. And then we can walk in, in a faith that is real and tested. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I, do, I thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I just think as we, as we just meditate on what we just read, Lord, it's easy to, it's easy to kind of get in an attitude of, yeah, well, that was then and things are different now. And, or go by a public opinion or go by anybody's opinion. And I know from years of experience that the things that come my way are things that are allowed by my God. And that I can trust you in those situations. And Lord, it may be something that seems completely contrary. I can't imagine anything more contrary than seeing the Son of God completely brutalized. And yet him saying, all of this comes from above. So, Lord, I pray we would learn from our God and we would trust you. And God, I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. Sometimes it seems impossible, but that we would do that. And we thank you that you love us enough, God, to care for us. And I'm going to ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for a couple more minutes. And as we read here today, this one who was beaten and brutalized is going to go to the cross and he's going to die. And he's going to be buried, then he's going to raise again on the third day. And he's going to die for one reason, not because he's a martyr, not to get pity. He's going to die for one reason. That is, he's going to take our sin upon himself, pay the price, and then when he's raised from the grave, that is evidence and proof that our sin was taken care of. On the cross, he yelled, it is finished. When he rose from the grave, it was declared to the world that he is the victor. So today, listen, your sins can be washed away, wiped away, and you can have a clean slate. All you have to do, in some ways it's simple, is trust him. Now listen, that doesn't mean just mouth some words or say some things. It means I'm going to really trust him. I'm going to believe that he died for my sin, that he took my sin, the punishment that I deserve, and I'm going to put it and believe that he did that for me, and I'm going to trust him right now. And it should be a little bit frightening because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. But if you want to do that, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can say this prayer with me out loud. You can say it silently. It's not volume that matters. What matters is your heart needs to be sincere. This needs to come from deep in your heart. If you're watching online, you can say the prayer right where you're at. You don't have to be in this building. If you're backslidden, listen, man, you need to come home. Come home right now. Come back to Jesus. His arms are stretched open wide for you. You need to come back to him. So you can say this prayer with us. And let's say this prayer. Jesus Today, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And right now I'm asking you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I want you to come into my life and guide me. Today, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior.